and welcome to At Issue. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is H. Wayne Wilson, and today we have a special insight into what's happening in Washington, D.C. Of course, we know we have a new Speaker of the House of Representatives in Washington, and we'll be talking about what difference that might make with the representative from the 17th Congressional District. Her name is Sherry Bustos. Uh, Sherry, uh, your district, uh, part of Rockford, part of Peoria, all of Quad Cities, you're yep. on the road a lot. Yep, and all those counties in between, 14 all together. So let's talk about Paul Ryan. Okay. Um, Congress uh, does not have a, a very good favorability rating. In, 19, in 2001, according to Pew Research, 65% favorability rating. Most recently, same company, Pew, 22%. What, what, what's happening in Washington that, that there's so much partisanship and uh, it, might Paul Ryan make a difference? Well, thanks for pointing that out. <laughs> that I'm part of this body that is very, very unpopular. I didn't say uh, you personally. <laughs> well, um, yeah, you know, I mean, it's. I, I understand that that people don't feel so great about Congress. Look at uh, look over the last, gosh, I don't know, five, six, seven years. It's been so highly partisan, and uh, we've, we've got a lot of work to do. You know, we we're, were just talking before we we got started here off camera, but you know, we're in the Midwest. We're this congressional district that I represent. We are, I think, normal, hardworking, for the most part, middle class families. We have a lot of farmers. We have a lot of people in manufacturing. You know, the, the expectation of people in this region is they want their elected official, whether it's at the state level, local level, federal level, to get things done. And if there's something that's getting in the way, the expectation is that you sit down and work things out. And so I understand this unpopular rating among members of Congress. So we have a new Speaker of the House. What, what is that going to mean? Um, here's my early assessment that we finished 2015 in pretty good shape. You, you look at what we passed, came together bipartisan fashion to pass a five-year highway bill. That had not happened in about a decade. So, so pretty good. It's a, it's, a, it's a decent bill. It'll be good for Illinois. It'll be good for the Peoria region. Uh, the other thing we passed was we brought all of those 12 uh, different uh, departments together, divisions together within the federal government and passed one giant omnibus bill that kept government functional. We didn't close down the federal government. And there's a lot of good elements in that uh, for working men and women, for uh, companies like Caterpillar. Uh, so, and Paul Ryan shepherded that through. So my assessment by the end of the year before we came home for the holidays was, you know, he's off to a good start. Now, 2016, uh, you know, the, one of the first votes that we took in our first week back was for the 62nd time was to get rid of the Affordable Care Act. I think that that is part of that rating that why people are disgusted with members of Congress. Why are we wasting our time for the 62nd time to vote for something that we know is not going to happen? Let's look at the elements of the Affordable Care Act that are not working and, and fix those. But, you know, we now have what, 17 million additional Americans who are insured. So let's fix what's broken, but stop the nonsense of voting 60 sec 62 times. Let's, let's talk about the Affordable Care Act. And you've mentioned there are some things that need to be mm -hmm. fixed in it. It's not perfect yet. You have a particular interest because you lost a sister-in-law and you lost a brother to cancer. Your brother in particular had insurance, but it wasn't covered, his, his treatment wasn't covered Correct. under his policy. What is it that we need to fix in the Affordable Care Act? Do you have an example or two of how we can make it better as yeah, opposed I, to getting rid of it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and if you look at what's working so far, uh, the fact that our children up to age 26 can stay on our insurance, um, that was a big problem before. I have a, my youngest son is 25 years old, works full time, just bought a, his first home, but his employer doesn't provide insurance. Um, so I'm, I'm very, very happy that he can stay on our insurance. My other son is 28 years old, uh, fully employed, has a good job, but his employer doesn't provide insurance. So he has bought into the health exchange. So he has access to insurance. So those kind of stories are told 17 million times over these days. Um, what needs to be fixed is the fact that um, while health care costs have been rising at a rate that's lower than it had been over the last uh, 10 plus years, it's still rising and people are concerned about that because our wages are not rising accordingly. Um, so as part of the Affordable Care Act, we have in there these what was called demonstration projects. Um, it gets a little convoluted, but I worked in healthcare for 10 years, so I understand this uh, very, very well. But th the idea of this is that we would take 
best practices where instead of paying what's the old fashioned fee for service, every time you go to a doctor, there's an additional expense. Now um, there are components of, of uh, these demonstration projects where you pay doctors and hospitals for their outcomes. So it's, it's, if, you, if you keep going back, there's no incentive for hospitals and, and doctors to do that. Well, we've got to take these projects and figure out how do you systemize those throughout America to help keep those costs down so Americans aren't paying more. Um, we also need to be able to um, negotiate prescription drug prices. That's what's rising at a higher rate than anything else. We, we do that in some um, portions of the federal government, but, but we don't entirely, and we need to be able to do that. Is there any hope that those issues might come up in the form of a bill that might be addressed in a bipartisan manner? There are bills out there to address what I'm talking about right now. I'm, I'm a co-sponsor of several bills that help address f uh, fixing what's broken. Um, however, it does require uh, Republican leadership. I'm not trying to get partisan here, but it is Republicans who um, are dominant in the House and the Senate now, and they control the schedule of what is and is not uh, brought up for a vote. Well, then let's talk about bills uh, in another arena, and that is uh, you were the sponsor of the American Flag Act, mm -hmm. and you were the sponsor of the Government Waste Reduction Act. A year ago, approximately, on both those bills, they were referred to the uh, Committee on Oversight in Government. Mm -hmm. uh, the, and the American Flag Act says, make American flags in America, in simple terms. That seems like that's a good idea. I mean, a, a common person would say, sure, I'd like my American yeah. flag to be made in America. Why has it been sitting in committee for a year? Well, um, to back up a little bit farther, I, the, my, the last session of Congress, I sponsored legislation that required the Department of Defense to make sure that they only purchased American-made American flags. So that passed. Um, now, what this one is requires not only that American flags be made in America, but that they also be made with American products and that every federal agency has to do that. So to your question, absolutely, why is that not making progress? We have 100 plus co-sponsors of that now. Um, I can't see any partisan reason. I, I don't care if you are the farthest left member of Congress or the farthest right member of Congress. Um, this is something that ought to make it out of committee and we ought to be able to bring that up for a vote. Um, I think we've done a very good job out of my office of getting those co-sponsors. Again, to have more than 100 co-sponsors, we think it's time to call this up for a vote and to move this through. Um, to your other question about the Government Waste Reduction Act, um, we just actually made a little bit of progress on a, a, a companion bill um, that we, um, I wrote that out of, out of our office. Um, we had Republican, a Republican co-sponsor of that, and we actually passed that out of the House passed it out of the Senate, and the president signed this into law. And what that does is address $125 billion worth of wasteful spending um, through a measure that you just share data among federal agencies and also among different levels of government at the state level, at the local level. We think that can address as much of, as $125 billion of spending that shouldn't be made at the federal level. Earlier, you mentioned the transportation bill. Uh, on your website, uh, you say, quote, gas should be affordable to help small businesses grow and get our economy moving again. So in order to do that, we have a, a five-year transportation bill. It's not fully funded. And last fall, when you were on the program here with uh, former Transportation Secretary Ray LaHood, he suggested that the gas tax needed to be increased. Mm -hmm. You said we should look at some corporate funding of that. Uh, through uh, particular types of taxes. Mm -hmm. With the price of gas now having dropped well below $2, a barrel of oil is $26, $27, are you more receptive to raising the gas tax? Uh, so what I, the measure that I supported is, is basically a repatriation of corporate profits. Um, we literally have billions of dollars, um, tens and hundreds of billions of dollars in corporate profits that are sitting overseas with no incentive for business to bring those, those dollars home. Um, the uh, measure that I supported received bipartisan support, and the reason I supported that as opposed to a gas tax is because it had bipartisan support, and I believe that there was movement momentum to make that happen. Um, it would have funded six years worth of bridge projects, highway projects. 
Um, and uh, so it was, it was actually a, a mechanism that I thought was doable politically um, and could have given us six years worth of funding. As far as the gas tax goes, um, I was on the road yesterday uh, up in the Rockford area. Gas was $1.64 a gallon. Um, I think the question is, is there a willingness, again, among the leadership to bring that up for a vote when we look at um, overhauling the, the tax code uh, to fund not just roads and bridges, but so many other projects that we need to do in America? Um, but you know, first and foremost, it's got to be brought up for a vote and see if the, the will of Congress is there. I want to talk about uh, the tornado of November 2013 that hit Washington, East Peoria, Pekin, and uh, I think a total of 12 communities had tornadoes in Illinois that day. There was a sudden outcry saying FEMA can't, under the formula, FEMA can't provide federal funds to help. So everybody was on board, from the governor to representatives to senators, mm -hmm. saying, we're going to fix this. Mm -hmm. We're two years and three months later, and nothing has happened to change the, the formula by which FEMA uh, decides how to provide federal relief funds. What's the holdup? Uh, the holdup is is that while virtually every member of Congress in Illinois, um, I think all 18, or every downstate member of Congress in Illinois and uh, Senator Durbin were all very supportive of looking at the, the Federal Emergency Management Agency formula for making sure that there could be federal aid in the event of, you know, a tornado, flooding, et cetera. The problem is is that if you are in more of an urban area, um, there is a limited number of dollars that go out for these kind of disaster relief um, funds, and they see it as a loss to their area. Um, we've got legislation. Um, I, Rodney Davis, Congressman Davis, Republican out of central Illinois, um, at the time Aaron Schock uh, was very supportive of this. We all worked to get uh, bipartisan support, and the, the political will was not there to make that happen. Um, we need it. Um, obviously, the communities that I represent, the commu communities that Darren LaHood represents, Rodney Davis represents, um, we, we need to make sure this happens. It, it, we will have natural disasters that will happen in the, in the future, unfortunately. Um, I can tell you that we're committed to making this, this change. Um, I think it's a heavy political lift to make it happen, unfortunately. You are heavily involved with Veterans Affairs, and uh, you recently stopped by the Peoria VA cl mm -hmm. Clinic. and. Um, your concern there is, is that approximately 15% of the clients that go to the VA clinic in Peoria have appointments that extend beyond the 30-day limit. The national average is 8%. What, what kind of power do you have to help to fix that? The power that I have in this situation is uh, what I see as my role as a watchdog. Um, I'm a former reporter. I was uh, an investigative reporter. So these are the kind of, um, when I see something wrong that's happening at the federal government, I'm part of the federal government. Um, I, I can't change laws like that. I'm, I'm uh, by far in the, you know, the minority as far as Democrats in Congress. Um, I realize how hard it is to change laws. Um, but I also know that um, I can be the watchdog on this, and that's the role that I, I see myself playing in the situation of uh, the, the outpatient clinic here in Peoria. Uh, here's the reality of this. We, we had a scandal that broke, what, two years ago now out of Arizona where there was um, you know, possibly even criminal behavior that was going on by staff at the VA where there were these fraudulent wait lists. Uh, so where it appeared that, that veterans were being treated in a timely manner, and they weren't. They had these, this dual wait list. Um, so immediately we checked out all of the VA clinics. I have six clinics in my congressional district, checked out all of them, made in-person visits, uh, talked with the, the administration that oversees them, found out that that was not the case at any of our clinics here, uh, thank, thank goodness. Um, but what we also found out is that the wait time varies from clinic to clinic depending on um, the caseload, and, and I think also depending on who's managing those. Um, here in Peoria, the wait list is longer than any of the other clinics in my congressional district. Um, in, in some cases, many, many times longer than the wait list at, at the other clinics. Also, in the entire Midwestern region, they're the longest right here in Peoria. So something's wrong. So what I've done is been in regular communication with the, the, the uh, leaders over this area. Um, I, I think it's important to note that um, in my time in Congress, 
we are now on the third acting director overseeing this region. Um, and that's by design. Uh, fr frankly, the, the, uh, at least the, the first director was not doing his job. Uh, so now there's a plan in place to reduce the numbers of, of the wait times. Right now, they're almost at 16% of veterans are having to wait past the 30-day um, litmus test. That's, that's unacceptable. As you said, the national average is 8%. At some of our clinics, they're as low as uh, 2%. So um, they've got to fill vacancies among their, their providers, their, their physicians. Um, they've got to do some work on their software system. They are looking at the hours that they serve veterans. Um, and they're also taking a look at what's called a Veterans Choice Program, where if veterans choose and there's not, not the care needed within the VA, they can go outside the VA to get that care. So all of those are part of, I hope, the, the answer to get these numbers down. But we'll keep an eye on that. How about getting jobs for uh, veterans? The Jobs for Heroes Act? Yeah. Has that been effective? Um, it's, it's a start. Um, it's actually legislation that we wrote out of our office and, and was just passed as part of this um, overall uh, bill that we, we passed out of Congress at the end of the year. But what it does, it actually opens up the tax credits that businesses uh, currently get. It expands those to include uh, reserves and National Guard. It's, you know, hey, if, you, if you're serving our country, we don't think if, if you're part of the reserves or National Guard that you should be excluded from that program. Um, so we've, also, we've extended those tax credits for businesses to hire our veterans who have done so much for us. Uh, I want to go overseas for a moment and uh, talk a little bit about uh, the, um, the, the situation with uh, Iran, the situation with North Korea. Uh, can, can you give us an update on what's happening in terms of the negotiations and, and where you, mm -hmm. were those effective or with John Kerry working with his counterpart in Iran to try to diplomatically resolve the nuke issue? Has that been effective in your estimation? Well, I, I think the, the deal was historic. I mean, if you think about even the people who were sitting around the table uh, to come to this agreement, you had China, sitting around the table, Russia, and then our European partners. So the, the deal that, ca that they came up with, while not perfect, um, has moved us in, the, in a direction that's very, very important for uh, the security of the world. Um, I think what's most notable is since this agreement was signed and um, agreed to, uh, the nuclear reactor that was, that was in Iran has been removed and the core of it filled with concrete. Uh, so it is absolutely unusable. The, the materials that uh, could be used to make a nuclear weapon in Iran have been, have been shipped out of that country. Um, you know, when, when we, we signed off on this agreement, they, the talk was that the breakout time to build a nuclear weapon was only two to three months away. Um, now that breakout time is year, more than a year away. So there's absolutely, if, if everything were reversed today, they could not turn around and make a nuclear weapon. Um, that, that's, that's notable. Um, the, the sanctions, now we, you know, that's somewhat controversial. Um, well, the, the H.R. 3460, I believe it is, and that uh, removed the power of the president to eliminate the sanctions until January 21st of 2017. Happens to be the date that a new president will take over. Oh, that's the significance <laughs> of that, yeah. Maybe politics at play again, right? Um, well, but, but the, the sanctions now um, that we've had in place since the, um, you know, since the 70s against Iran, um, they are being lifted um, at, in a measured way. Uh, but I think the other thing that's important for anybody watching this program or any American to know is that there's a snapback provision in that. And all that means is that if Iran violates any section of this, uh, this agreement that, is, that we've come to among all of these nations, um, those sanctions can snap back immediately. And, and that's pretty important to know. We just, we just had something that was a little bit scary with our, with our 10 sailors who, who went into um, Iranian waters. Um, and, and there have been new sanctions um, that have resulted. But um, I think it's very important to note that we can move on um, any kind of uh, putting those sanctions back in place if there's bad behavior by Iran. And we're keeping an eye on any movement along the lines of a, a nuclear weapon 24-7, uh, 365 days a year. We have people on the ground keeping an eye on this. Situation's a little bit different in North Korea. 
Um, negotiations took place with Iran and in other countries, as you mentioned. North Korea, there's a wild card over there. Yeah, oh, boy. And uh, we don't know if that's a hydrogen bomb that they explode, or they say they exploded one. Uh, what's your take on how we might resolve that situation? No, I, resolving it is, uh, boy, that's a huge word in something when, as, as you just pointed out, we have, there's so much unpredictability with the leader of North Korea. Um, I think it's one of those things that we, we monitor very, very closely. Um, we do that with our, with our allies and, um, and we act accordingly. I, I, I don't have a better answer than that, but it's, uh, there's a, a leader there that's a pretty scary individual. Let's move from big weapons to little weapons in the Second Amendment. You, uh, you, your husband's a sheriff of Rock Island County, and you have very clearly are uh, pro-Second Amendment. So how do you approach solving the gun violence problem in America today? Every time we have a mass shooting, we hear the president, we hear others say, we've got to figure out a way to solve this. What's your approach? Well, the president just, uh, through executive action, um, uh, put what uh, he considers um, some kind of resolution to this. Um, I think several of those are areas, you know, to, to make sure that guns stay out of the hands of deranged individuals. I, I can't imagine anybody disagreeing with that. Um, the, my husband is the sheriff, and I just sat down with about 20 sheriffs from throughout Illinois to ask them, you know, you are the lead law enforcement officer in your respective counties. Um, what really will help solve this? And there was only one area of consensus among the sheriffs from these 20 plus counties. And that is um, if somebody is known to have, uh, to be dangerously mentally ill, which um, you know, those in law enforcement deal with on an ongoing basis, um, we have to make sure that they do not have access to guns. Uh, one of the areas of the president's executive action addresses that. If there's a person who comes into a mental health clinic that is making threats, saying that they are going to uh, get a gun and they're going to do something dangerous, um, one of the um, areas now is that that information can be shared with those in law enforcement to help deal with the situation before it escalates to um, a another mass shooting. Um, I, I support um, legislatively action, I've signed off as a co-sponsor, that would do um, one thing, and, and that is to keep guns away from people who are deranged. Um, I, I, I think that is the, the best thing that we can do in our country. There are 300 million guns in America. Uh, the vast, vast majority of people who have guns, they want to use them to hunt or to go to uh, the shooting range. I, I have three sons. Um, all of whom own guns and like to hunt and like to go to shooting range. And, and um, I don't want to do anything that would get in the way of that. But at the same time, we, we do have to do everything we can to keep guns out of the hands of people who are deranged. Let's finish up this half hour with a discussion of uh, the two big manufacturing companies in your district. Caterpillar uh, is on the, the fringe of your district. Mm -hmm. And uh, John Deere, of course, is in your district. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what kind of manufacturing future does this country have and what is the government doing to encourage that? I think we could have a great future in manufacturing. Um, and and we, the, the numbers, the hard numbers show what a great future we can have, but we've got to get our workforce ready for the next uh, industrial revolution. We have an estimated three million jobs that will be available over the next 10 years in manufacturing. Right now, we're prepared only to fill one out of every three of those jobs. Um, it's why I've been a lead sponsor of um, several pieces of legislation that call, are, are called Make It in America. It's why I just had an economic summit one week ago today uh, with people uh, from throughout Peoria and the Quad Cities and Rockford and the counties in between that are addressing this skills gap that exists and addressing the talent pipeline that we need to make sure that we are developing to get people ready for the jobs of the future at Caterpillar and Deere and so many of the me, uh, smaller and medium-sized manufacturers. Um, I think we have to focus on job prep. Um, I, I want to give a lot of credit to Jennifer Daly here in Peoria who's addressing the, the need of training people all the way back to the junior high level, getting ready for these jobs. And I think the other message to parents out there is jobs in manufacturing are great jobs. And, and, you know, don't think of these jobs as something that you don't want your kids to go into because they are jobs that where you can support your family. Uh, they are good paying jobs and they are the, job, the jobs of the future.
and the reference to Jennifer Daly is she is the executive director of the Economic Development Council for the Greater Peoria area. Um, real quickly, in 30 seconds okay. or less, redistricting, where, you, where do you stand? Because your district is pretty big. Yeah, yeah, and, it's, it's pretty big and, and a little bit oddly shaped. Uh, I support having an independent council uh, take a look at our legislative districts. Uh, redistricting has been harmful to the democratic process. Um, I also support campaign finance reform. Uh, Citizens United has been very harmful to our democracy. I think if we fix those two things, we'll go a long way in helping America. And with that, we are out of time. I always appreciate your visits here in the studio. And <laughs> we'll for look forward me. to your next one. Sherry Bustos is the representative for the 17th Congressional District out of uh, Rock Island. Or Moline, I believe, is, is home. Yeah, that, that's where I live, yep. Okay. Um, we'll be back next week with another edition of At Issue. This time we're going to look at the nonprofit arena and how they're coping in today's economy. Join us next time on At Issue.